when we talk about the rethink, the first we have to start with the basic thinking, why we are here and what brought us here as well. I was going through the book uh, Dr. Ishrat recently published, and the more I go through that, it reminded me, uh, apologies from, from the foreigners, it reminded me Munid Niazi's verses. And that was more like, like, Kuch unj vi rama okhyan san, Kuch gal vich gama da tok vi si, Kuch sher de log vi zalam san, Kuch sanu maran da shok vi si. So if we look at the analysis which he has presented, why we are here, so I think these are not the challenges, these are the consequences of the choices we made over the period. And that's where the rethink and the big rethink comes into play. So Dr. Sab, starting from govern the ungovernable, talking about the, the economy of an elitist state, what is different in this particular book if we talk about the Pakistan economic challenge and solutions? First of all, let me thank Asfar, Asan, and Ali Akai for uh, asking me to join this very prestigious uh, summit and to provide this opportunity for discussing the contents and the main messages of my book. So because there are many youngsters here who are not familiar with the economic history and there's so much preoccupied with the present predicament of Pakistan's economy, I wanted to take them back to the main findings of my book, Governing the Ungovernable, which I did at Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. And because of the Library of Congress, I had a lot of access to the materials which I couldn't get in Pakistan. And uh, to my surprise, I found that Despite many internal and external shocks from the 1947 till, two, uh, till 1990, Pakistan was one of the fastest developing countries for 40 years, growing at six and six and a half percent. While India, which is eight times bigger than us and got part partitioned at the same time, and with a lot of factor endowments, including industrial capital, as well as the human resources, was growing at three and three and a half percent per year, and it was called Hindu rate of growth. And Pakistan's poverty level were also declining as compared to the rest of the developing countries. But then the slide starts from 1990 to 2015 where I finished the data and I found that Pakistan is now a sick man as far as South Asia is concerned. India overtook us in 2012 or 2000, no, even before that and Bangladesh overtook us in 2015. So the question which I explored was why did this happen? And this is a good experiment for economists that within one country you have two different outcomes. And I came to the conclusion that all these five, six hypotheses were not explaining the Pakistan's growth and slide, rise and fall, but it was the decline of the institutions of governance which were responsible for that. So this book which you mentioned is a attempt in order to find solutions to regain Pakistan's lost place in the Committee of Nations. That is the purpose. And what is new about it is that I looked at the political parties, the major political parties' manifestos, their agreements with the IMF, because every government has done agreements with the IMF, and they point out as to what actions they are going to take. And I also looked at the speeches made by the prime ministers and the finance ministers. And I would like to inform this audience 
that there is very little difference between the policy pronouncements and the manifestos and the agreements which the respective governments have signed between PPP, PMLN, and PTI. And this is a very powerful message for the people who say, well, there's no political will. And I'll come to why these policies are not, you know, implemented. But let me recap the main findings as to where is the consensus on the economic policies and governance in this country. Everybody wants to improve governance and delivery of public services to the public. Second, everybody wants to target assistance to the poor, and BISP is an example which started with the PPP government, continued with the PMLN government, and then with the PTI government, and has done a wonderful job as far as the poor is concerned. Everybody pays lip service that we have to invest in human capital, take care of science and technology, because that is the future of the country. There is no disagreement on that. Then, as you heard Mr. Hassan Iqbal also, and Prime Minister, and before that Imran Khan, and before that, you know, uh, Mr. Zardari, they say we have to enhance the export competitiveness because the gap between our imports and exports is so high that we have to resort to borrowing and that is making us a debt trap. So everybody says exports. Then we say we have to attract the foreign direct investment. And foreign direct investment brings in not only capital, but technology, managerial practices, market access, and that is much higher value addition as compared to just the domestic investors, because domestic investors then seep into their own ways what the foreign investors are doing. Then everybody has come to the conclusion that financial sector has to be more inclusive. It has done a good job, and I want to record that, that the banking sector, the financial sector, has played a very major role after privatization. But the outreach to the SMEs, to agriculture, to low-cost housing, that has stagnated. We had actually reached, by 2006, 17% of all private sector credit was for SMEs. Today it is down to 6 to 7 percent. And SMEs are the backbone as far as the manufacturing and services sector are concerned. Then on the foreign economic relations, and Mr. Moid Yusuf is here who is the architect of this geoeconomics, we say our strategic location is such that we should capitalize this situation for our strengthening our economic relations with Central Asia, with South Asia, with the Middle East. And we are able to do that if we give the priority to our foreign economic relations. Then every government has committed to the IMF that we want to maintain macroeconomic stability and fiscal prudence, but they haven't delivered on that. That is a different thing. And coming to the climate change, uh, which is a phenomena which is external to Pakistan, uh, the governments of the day, whether it was the previous government or this government, have been agitating for quite some time that how can we have the food, energy, and water nexus in order to keep ourselves afloat in the face of the climate risks. And finally, as we heard in the previous, the world ahead of us is based on digitalization, 
big data, data analytics, cloud comp computing, robotics, artificial intelligence, and digital Pakistan is something which every government wants to do it. So that is the gist of all the policies, pronouncements of the definitely the major political parties. So that is which I wanted to highlight before this audience and in this book that my reading of the last 30 years shows me that there is very little disagreement on these major issues. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Can you give this mic first? Let me use this one. Uh, I'll request the audience to keep preparing one or two questions. We will be taking one or two questions uh, uh, in, in another 10 minutes. But Dr. Sir, just uh, expanding on that, you have created a very good uh, analysis between the political party and how they are evolving and how it's impacting the, the economy uh, and the periods where we have seen the success, those periods, unfortunately, are not the one where the democratic government was very strong. And secondly, I think there's a very good analysis around the insecurity of the, of the government and how those insecurity led the decision making which were not bold enough, which otherwise the country was, was supposed to make at that time. So if you look that an, on that analogy, how you see that political system compared to other countries like China, East Asia, how their political system is working, which is not much different in terms of their perception and complexities. Well, that's a very good observation. Let me say this in this book, we have a very distinct feature of Pakistan's economy. Every two years, you have a rotation as far as the government of the day is concerned. 88 to 90, BB 90 to 92, Nawaz Sharif and the cycle goes on. And from 19, uh, 2008, 2009, Yusuf Raza Gilani, Raja Parvez Ashraf, then Mia Nawaz Sharif, then Shahid Khakan Abbasi, then Imran Khan, then Shahbaz If you do not provide the space to the political parties for an entire five years, they would not be trying to bring about these kind of reforms and implement what they have said. They are struggling for their political survival. And when they're struggling for their political survival and they do not know whether they will be in office tomorrow or not, they will not take very difficult, unpopular decisions because they will further undermine and those who are trying to get them out of the office will use those unpopular decisions which will have adverse consequences in the short term to beat them with the stick. And that is the reason. Unless you have a complete security of tenure where the prime ministers and the political parties are assured that if they take the first two years, very tough, unpopular decisions, but their consequences in year four and five will be positive, then they can go back to the electorate and say, look, we inherited such a big mess and we took some difficult decisions and we are very thankful to you that you borne that decisions. It had adverse consequences, but now look, the growth is going up the employment is going up, the inflation is going down, our current account deficit is declining. So vote us into power so that we can do it for next five years. And unless you have these spots of 10 years, no reforms can ever be implemented. You have Manmohan Singh for 10 years, you have Ajpai, and then you had Modi for 10 years, and India has really done well. Khalda Zia, five years, and then Hasina Wajid, now 10 years, and Bangladesh has really taken off. So give the security of tenure to the political parties so that they find themselves in a position to implement some of these pronouncements. They don't have time for that, and they want to do some short-term, you know, maneuver in order to stay in power. 
Now, thank you, sir. I think there is another observation, and I was in, in ASEAN region and working in Asia Pac for the last three, four months very closely with the government, development agencies, ADB, World Bank, and the businesses and society. So a couple of observations and which I picked up, it was very interesting that exactly same thing which was referred back in the, in the book. Uh, and that's also referred to the China's model of centralized political uh, decision making and decentralized the economic or the business related decision making to right. the uh, units which are closer to the, to the businesses. And if you look at the Bangladesh structure or if you look at even Nepal right now, they have created 700 plus units who are managing the public financial management very close to uh, close to the, to the civilians and the, where they really operate. So if you look at the Pakistan, whatever the challenge we are, we are looking at from an economic perspective, I think there is a certain understanding that it's coming because we are not consistently operating in a certain structure where people can execute, that could be a one thesis around it. And number two, the competency of human capital to really relate to that and their securities to make those decisions and work very closely to the citizen to deliver that citizen services. So how you see that yeah. political structure and the economic relationship in terms of devolution of power? Yeah, I think you both my chapters on China and East Asia very clearly indicate that while there is a vision for the future, Deng Xiaoping had a 25-year perspective plan for China and every president who came after Deng Xiaoping fine-tuned that perspective plan as far as the external environment was concerned to adjust themselves to adapt. But the major thrust that we have to take 700 million people out of poverty, we have to have a double-digit growth rate, we have to have urban amenities for the public, we have to get human capital, those remain completely untouched. So, policies and vision was coming from the future, but it was the towns and the villages and the provinces which were given complete autonomy to execute those particular projects, programs, and policies, and they were held accountable. People say China is a very, you know, inward-looking society, and there is a lot of control of the Communist Party. But it is the most meritocratic society where if you are a town head and you have done very well, then you will be promoted as the mayor of the uh, city. And from the mayor of the city, if you do well, you will become the governor of the province, and from the governor of the province, you will become the Politburo member. So because of this incentive structure, everybody is trying to struggle that they should excel each other, so that is a competition. In Pakistan, we had 2001 to 2007, and in my book, uh, Governing the Ungovernable, I have reproduced the surveys which were taken up, where the level of satisfaction of the people under the local government was the highest. They said, we get services at our doorsteps because the decisions were made by the union councils and by the district councils who knew their problems and they also knew how to solve those problems. But when you concentrate power in the provinces or in the federal government, I am ashamed that as a secretary planning department in the government of Sindh during my youth arrogant days, 500 schools I approved for primary didn't know whether there were demand for those schools, where there were teachers which will be available, there will be funds to operate that. But when you look at the district council, they say, we don't need a school here. We can connect this school of girls with a road to the other village, and the girls from that village will come to this. Those are the kind of decisions which are making people satisfied and also using your resources more efficiently and effectively. Look at the PSTP of the federal government and look at the ADPs of the provincial government. If they are executed by the local governments, you can have twice as many benefits as what you're getting today. So I'm a great believer in devolution, delegation of financial powers, autonomy to the local governments, 
with accountability for results. The Wait. Chinese model and the East Asian model is you have to be accountable for results. It is not a free ride for you. So the moment you do this, I can assure you on another platform, which is the satisfaction with the politics. If people are getting their children educated, if their family can get the medicines and the health uh, attention, if they can get water supply, which is drinkable, if they have clean environment, if they public transport, the ordinary citizen doesn't care what the uh, foreign exchange reserves are, what the current account deficit is, they have no link. So they will be very much satisfied because their own day-to-day -day life is much better because of this. So thank you very much. I think I'll, uh, I'll pick up on two comments and then we will take a question from there. Just from a school perspective, I think there's a very practical example which Thailand is doing right now. From a 30,000 schools, they are reducing it to 7,000 because those 30,000 were built in past when the roads and the infrastructure was not there. And now they are doing exactly the same that where the school is required and if there is an infrastructure, how they can create a better transportation and consolidate those schools because the per capita or students per teacher is, is a one of a challenge for them to really bring those out. So that's a very like a bold political decision to close down schools and reduce that number. But they are making that kind of uh, decision. So we, it's not something which is a theory. We are seeing that happening there as well. So I'll pick up on two things. The one is the steam economy you discussed in that. And I think I, I really found that concept very interesting when we are adding the arts and the challenge our university or education is facing in terms of having that kind of human resource uh, or the professors or the teachers. And the second observation I'll pick, I, I would like you to share the experiences where the decisions were made on a vested interest when you were part of that, uh, uh, that process uh, where you are either hiring the VCs or you are hiring the uh, people for the PFM reforms and some of the vested interest really put it on a different side of it. So I think these are the things where we really need to understand and rethink that how we are going to make those decisions because we can't use the word challenges. It's a consequence of the choices we make and the decision parameter we set for ourselves. So over to you and then we will be coming for the question from the hall. Well, the steam economy is that in today's world, which is a knowledge economy, you have to equip your workforce with the knowledge of science, technology, engineering, creative arts, and mathematics. And my proposition is that you have to start it from the school stage. You don't have to wait them for the college. Today, you have an imbalance between the supply and demand. You have 30% graduate unemployment because we graduate them in history, in Islamic studies, in gender studies, and all kinds of subjects for which there is no demand in the economy. But we have shortage of math teachers. We have shortage of science teachers in the schools. And if you have shortage of those teachers, how are you going to teach these students? So the proposition which I'm making is that you have to start investing in these subjects right from the school level and also provide incentives to the science teachers and the math teachers be different from those who are doing other subjects so that they can devote time and attention. Provide them the infrastructure, the local area network, the tablets, the computers, all the paraphernalia which is required. So if you want to increase the educational budget, don't do it on brick and mortar, but do this on the propagation of these subjects. And that will take you a balance between your demand and supply. Uh, Japan, Japanese want 30,000 IT professionals by 2030. And their ambassador told me that only two universities in Pakistan are able to produce 250 to 300 graduates whom we can employ in Japan. Now, Japan was an ethnic society, very homogeneous. They never allowed the foreigners. And so is the Korea, but they're now opening up. So we have a youth bulge. Why don't we invest in preparing them to imbibe those skill sets which are not only required for the local economy, but also for the global economy, 
where the demographic changes are taking place. So that is what this team is all about. And I'm very glad that uh, Gilgil Baltistan, which I visited, has actually introduced. And they have got a third party, which is providing both the instruction as well as the infrastructure. So because they don't have science teachers, so there are models now which are available which can multiply this particular effort uh, throughout our schools. So thank you very much. And if we can pick up a question from the hall. Yeah. Uh, please. If you can have a mic here. Meanwhile, I'll throw another stats. I think uh, it's very interesting I figured out that. In Indonesia, with the 300 million people, they have got 65 million Hello. registered SME. Hello. Pakistan, with 24, 240 or 250 million population, we have got 5 million. Yeah. So one of five in Indonesia is an entrepreneur. And here we will look at, so it's one in 50. So you can well imagine the 49 people are looking for job, and they are looking for jobs in government where they don't want to really work very hard. That's a BA. Uh, Please. Tariq Ekram is my name uh, for everybody. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about the continuity, political policies, etc., etc. Under the rules of business 1973, the role of the bureaucracy is as follows to do the in analysis of the environment in which you are, uh, to envision the future to develop strategies, to develop plans, get these approved through the political maze, if you like, or whatever, implement, and then learn, and come back to. So that is the given responsibility of the bureaucracy. Uh, to what extent do you think that this continuity could be catered for by effective bureaucracy uh, in a country like Pakistan. And if they cannot ensure 100% continuity, they could actually shave off the peaks and reduce the troughs so that there is certain amount of continuity. Sir, if we can keep it precise. Yeah. Yep. So the question is, what would be the role of bureaucracy and have they fulfilled this role in the past or not? Tarek, you know better. You have dealt with the bureaucracy. Now there are two distinct sets of the bureaucracy's behavior. When I joined the civil service, we were guaranteed the security of job under the constitution, that nobody could remove us on arbitrary basis, not even the prime minister or the president. That was taken away in 1973. So the quality of intake into the bureaucracy has actually gone down. The best and the brightest who used to aspire for the civil service are no longer coming into the civil service. And the preferences have now shifted from the DMG to the police, to customs and income tax. And you know why those shifts have taken place, number one. Number two. Bureaucracy is no longer permanent bureaucracy like the British or like India. Every government comes in and brings in their own favorites to all the key positions. Chief Secretary, IG Police, Secretary to the Prime Minister, Secretary uh, Cabinet, Secretary Establishment, Secretary Interior. You know, I went to see the Secretary of Higher Education Department in Punjab. In three years, there were, I was looking at his board, there were 11 secretaries in three years' time. So where is the permanence, where is the continuity? There is more discontinuity in the bureaucracy as compared to the politicians. Politicians change after two years, they change after three months, two months. So this myth that bureaucracy can provide the continuity has been shattered after the politicization of our bureaucracy. Thank you, Appointments sir. are made not on merit, but on loyalty and favoritism. And that is what happens. Now, thank you. Thank you, sir. Very, thank you very much. And uh, 
I'm sure DocSub will be here and we can have more interaction around it, but I'll encourage you to just uh, look at that book. I think it has got uh, a lot of stuff for us to understand before we start in a rethinking. Otherwise, we might think it's a rethink, but we might be doing the same thing which we have done in past. So choices and consequences are the key word rather than the challenges and opportunity. Which are choices we are going to make explicitly by staying silent or just complying because of our vested in trust, that will have consequences for us and our next generations as well. And we will be held accountable somewhere, sometime, for those choices which we are making today. So thank you very much. And uh, we will have those questions in, 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 uh, uh, while we are having a lunch and other networking session. So Dr. Sub, thank you very thank much you. for your time. I'll encourage everybody just to look at that book, buy the book, study that. You will find a very interesting uh, analysis as well as the references uh, which Dr. Sub has made. And from a human capital perspective, I think there was a very good case which was made why they should be incentivized and paid a fair wages as well and uh, why we should not look at our wage and then not to hire somebody who is more competent and paying them more become an ego issue for me. I think these are the kind of examples and the situations which have been discussed in the book and uh, you will find it very, very interesting. So Dr. Sub, thank you thank very you much very for much. your time. Thank you.